The American Physical Society, a global network of physicists with the mission to advance and diffuse the knowledge of physics for the benefit of humanity, to promote physics and serve the broader physics community. Each year, the APS March meeting brings together scientists and students from around the world to connect and collaborate across academia, industry and the major labs. This year's March meeting combines the excitement of the Las Vegas Strip with the thrill of scientific discovery and APS TV is here to cover it all. Hello and welcome to APS TV. I'm your host Stephen Horn and I'm so thrilled to be here to take you through the next four days of the 2023 March meeting. You know this is my 12th APS March meeting and I'm so delighted to be here in person in Las Vegas. Over the next four days we'll be sitting down with the most influential people in the physics community today and join me as we go around the world looking at the leading research institutes, centres and companies who are at the cutting edge of physics today. Coming up, we sit down with the 2023 APS President Robert Rosner, as well as the APS CEO John Bagger. We'll talk about individuals pushing physics to new limits when we cover the Kavli Foundation Special Symposium. And then we'll talk to you and see just what you're looking forward to the most in this year's meeting. Each day you can find the latest episode of APS TV on the TVs placed around the convention centre. But don't worry if you miss us there, you can tune in right in your hotel room, channel 71 at the Ling and the Horseshoe Hotel and channel 74 at Harris. Remember, you can also find us on the APS website as well as on YouTube and Twitter channels. Plenty of ways to watch Today, we take a step back and see just how science is shaping our world. Our first visit, Germany, where Quantum Valley Lower Saxony is bringing together over 400 scientists, engineers and business professionals into a leading European hub. Then we'll take a quantum leap with ZQ, a Leipzig-based German deep tech company providing diamond spin-based quantum processors for early adopters. The Quantum Valley Lower Saxony covers the entire ecosystem of quantum technologies. The first moonshot goal is to build a fully programmable multi-register iron trap quantum computer by 2025. We are developing quantum clocks for a next generation of atomic clocks. We can push the bounds for the search of new physics. We want to demonstrate the benefit of this new technology for gravimetric Earth observation. We use nanophotonics to create synergies at the interface of quantum and nano world. The work conducted in gravitational wave research was crucial for the Nobel Prize awarded in 2017. We are pushing the frontiers of quantum science and innovation with a shared enthusiasm and dedication. The future society needs quantum computers because quantum computers can inherently solve complex problems in much more time efficient, power efficient and more accurate manner than any classical computers. XCQ is a deep tech startup based in Leipzig and Will. We are part of the quantum computing initiative from, by the German Aerospace Agency. XCQ takes mature R&D to early adopters and the 30 million euro grant of the Quantum Computing Initiative of the German Aerospace Center enables us to speed up our mission and to be part of this thriving ecosystem. At XCQ, we are developing scalable modular quantum processes. So we are in the early adoption of uh, AI, ML, into the quantum processes. We are aiming to use it for molecular dynamic simulations of particularly biomolecular structures, like small molecules, peptides, and later into a complex molecules like protein structure, DNA structure, integration into the system. In addition to our scalable and modular quantum processes, we are also doing miniaturization of the system, like a system on a chip, which can be used as a plug and play device. XCQ's future vision is to empower the next generation for quantum readiness. We want our technology to find its way in your wish list for Santa.
We now go to our studio where we sit down with none other than the 2023 APS President Robert Rosner and the APS CEO John Bagger. Well both thank you very much indeed for joining us today, we really appreciate it, so thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're here for, in Las Vegas for the uh, March meeting, how exciting is that? Super exciting. <laughs> I'm just thrilled to be here, it's the largest meeting and this is my term as President so I'm really happy to be here. It's great to be back after all these years to a full-scale in-person meeting Absolutely. with the addition of many of our colleagues uh, at home viewing virtually as well. So the combination is really it's fantastic. We've got the best of both worlds. Indeed. Yes. So, Bob, you started off your uh, year as, as uh, president. I guess my two questions are, first of all, how's it going? And second of all, what are you hoping to achieve this year? This particular uh, year, we're actually trying a new experiment of having both an in-person and a separate virtual meeting and I think it would be interesting to see how, how that goes. We have a great opportunity also to uh, join with other member societies of the American Institute of Physics, and I see great opportunities in uh, collaborating with them, having a win-win uh, exchange on various topics. In fact, there are a variety of or organizations already in place uh, where these interchanges can happen, and we want to see more of that. And then finally, I think we have a real opportunity to be more welcoming to folks who don't always make it to these meetings. And this includes uh, not just uh, physicists abroad, but also uh, folks that are underrepresented. Um, and uh, I think also the seed corn for our discipline, young, younger physicists, I think we want to bring them in. In terms of your own research, what, what are you most excited about in terms of your own work coming up? I'm really interested in the origins of cosmic magnetic fields. Where do these things come from? Uh, they exist in stars, they exist in planets, they exist in galaxies. And um, the question is, how did that happen? So theory has kind of led uh, for many years, and we had, had ideas for how the seed fields uh, happen. And also theories provided uh, ways of thinking about how these seed fields were amplified by, for example, turbulent motions. Mm -hmm. And what's really exciting is that over the last decade or so, it's been possible to both do simulations, computer simulations, to validate the theories. But even more exciting, we can now do experiments, for example, at the laser facilities, uh, at the National Edition facility at Livermore, at the LLE at Rochester, where we can actually generate seed fields and they can now amplify them by turbulence. So the challenge is to understand how order can come from chaos. We know, for example, the sun has a global magnetic field, a dipole field. Where the heck is that from? And we don't have a first principles understanding of how that works yet. And one of the questions is, is it going to be possible to do experiments, for example, at these laser facilities, to actually carry an experiment where we can see order coming out of chaos? And that's to be done. So I'm really excited about that possibility. John, APS itself, what work is currently being undertaken at the APS that uh, furthers its, its vision, its, its mission? So our mission is to advance and diffuse the knowledge of physics, and we're really doing that in three ways. The first is really maintaining our laser focus on our publications. We publish the world's leading journals in physics, and uh, we want to ensure that they continue to grow and adapt to our changing community. The second is to bring people together for meetings, for convening, to exchange ideas. And really what better opportunity is there than the March meeting to do this. And finally, we're really focused on building a broader and more inclusive community, expanding opportunity for people who want to pursue physics. One way these interconnect actually is that these virtual meetings that Bob was talking about actually are going global and we have satellite meetings under, that will be underway during the virtual meeting both in Africa and Asia where groups themselves will be coming together to hold their own little meetings and actually participating in our virtual meeting. And so this new technology, things we've learned in the pandemic are really allowing us to expand our reach globally to become a home for the world's physics community. Now I was reflecting myself this morning when I was coming over here that this will be my 12th uh, March meeting through APS TV, but that's a, a drop in the ocean, isn't it? And, and I was just wondering, how do you think the APS as an organization has evolved over the years? So APS, 
was launched in 1899. Next year is our 125th anniversary. And at the very first meeting of the American Physical Society, 36 physicists showed up in New York City. And my gosh, we have what, over 13,000 between the in-person and virtual components of this meeting alone. So again, we grow and evolve to meet the needs of our community, as Bob was saying. There's so much going on in the world of physics, isn't there? And I was wondering, final question to you would be, in this week that we're in Las Vegas, what are you hoping to get out of the week? I've already put on my, my list of things I'm absolutely going to go to, the uh, Kavli Symposium, for sure, uh, the talks uh, for the uh, Nobel uh, Symposium. And then there is a particular talk that I'm absolutely going to go to. It's uh, a, a talk by a graduate student at Harvard, uh, Linnell uh, Williams. She's going to talk about a topic that I think is becoming a real live wire topic, which is the cost the implicit cost and the explicit cost of being a graduate student. And I'm really, really interested in hearing her perspective on that question. I'm also really looking forward to the serendipity of it all because you drop into a session, you don't know what you're going to see and you're going to learn new stuff. And that's the whole point of a meeting like this. Thank you both so much for uh, joining us, taking the time to do that. It's been great and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you have it. You don't just have to take my word for it. Science truly is shaping our future. We've heard it from the top. Now let's visit the institutions whose innovations were created with that future in mind. International Linear Collider is a 20 kilometer long particle accelerator that we hope to build. The idea is to accelerate electrons and positrons and annihilate them and make the heaviest, most mysterious particles that we know in nature, the W boson, the Higgs boson, and study their properties. The whole design of the ILC aims to achieve its scientific goals with the minimal amount of resources. At the very heart of the accelerating technology is energy efficiency. And this is why we use, for instance, superconducting structures in order to accelerate the particles. These big goals in high energy physics motivate the construction of really novel technologies. And there are lots of people around the world who are very eager to do this physics and we're trying to work together. Scientists from about 50 countries collaborate and we need to make everybody work together, produce the best ideas and still keep a coherent design. Kubernetes is an online platform that makes it possible to access all the different quantum software and hardware in one location. You can sign up really quickly, get started, write your quantum programs, and run on real hardware really fast. Our platform mainly consists of hardware devices as well as software SDKs that are available for users via a subscription as well as freely. One of the things that we are the most proud of about Kubernetes Lab is the Kubernetes Lab Environment Manager for creating and managing Python and other virtual environments. We have a list of all the breadth of quantum software packages that are the most widely used and provide you access to each of these computers without having to go through a third-party cloud provider. By and large, the majority of our sensors and instruments are used in general research projects all over the world. When Janice joined Lakeshore, we recognized how their cryogenic expertise and products could expand our existing solutions. CryoComplete is a series of complete cryogenic measurement solutions. Uh, it has our M81 synchronous source measure system, our 335 temperature controller, VPF100 cryostat, calibrated sensor, and measure link software. Because each part of CryoComplete, from the sensor, instrumentation, cryostat, is a piece Lakeshore designs and manufactures, we have full control of optimizing the entire measurement signal path. I can't wait to see all the research CryoComplete will enable.
While the meeting is packed with astonishing accomplishments and innovations at nearly every corner, this year's Cavalry Foundation Special Symposium encapsulates awe-inspiring phenomena spanning across scales, starting with exciting physics at the ultra-cold atomic level, followed by the richness of quantum matter at the mayoscopic scale, progressing to the scale of our precious Earth and its climate, and finally to the wonders of the cosmos. Come now as we chat with the speakers before they take the stage. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. This is great. Tell us a little bit about gravitational waves. What are they? We like to say that these are ripples in space-time, which sounds very mysterious. But what we actually mean is curvature of space-time. Einstein's theory says that masses like the Sun curve the space-time and then that the Earth goes around the Sun because it follows the shortest path in a curved space-time. And if you have two bigger masses, like two black holes orbiting around each other, then the curvature of the space-time is now a wavy signal and those are the gravitational waves. Tell us a little bit about uh, LIGO. Tell us a bit about how you detect these gravitational waves. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So we use a laser and we split it in two and the two beams travel a very long path, four kilometers. They are reflected on mirrors that are suspended in vacuum. This is all very complex. And these lasers travel in vacuum. And when they get back, they interfere. That's why we call this an interferometer. And that interference patterns tells us about the difference between these lengths. So if one arm gets shorter, the other arm gets longer. And that's what produces the interference that we measure. And that's what gravitational waves do. They make one arm shorter, the other arm longer. So that's how we detect them. So you're addressing the, taking part in the Kavli Symposium uh, this year, which is a great honor. And uh, tell us a little bit about what you'll be talking about. Well, <clears throat> we are talking in the symposium about all the different scales. <laughs> In, in physics, and I'm supposed to be talking about the biggest scale of all, which are these black holes that we have measured that are billions of light years away. And that's amazing. But what I also will say is that to do this, we have to measure these gravitational waves that are tiny, tiny, tiny distortions in distances. We are measuring changes in distances that are a part in a thousand of a proton diameter. So we connect the small with the large. It's a very exciting work that you do. And, uh, and part of Kavli, isn't it, is to make this accessible to uh, a, a wider audience. So what would you say to younger people who are fascinated by what you do in the field and would want to get involved in that? Curiosity. Curiosity is the main motivator. I was very curious as a girl and it served me well. And I think that's what we need. And we, we need not to lose it. We need to keep asking questions. And if we don't find the answers, then keep asking them and finding ourselves the answers. I guess my last question is, uh, you're the first uh, woman to be a professor of physics and astronomy here in the United States. How well are we doing at encouraging women into senior roles in physics? I was the first woman professor in Louisiana State University. <laughs> I have many women colleagues across the country. But um, we are doing better now at Louisiana State University. We added about the average, but the average is not that good. It's about 20% among professors. But what's worse than that is that that percentage, about 20-25%, is the number of women in studying undergraduate physics. And that's a shame. And it's a shame not because there are women who don't get the opportunity, but because we miss the talent. We are not getting the best talent into physics because we don't have those brains in there. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. And I hope the symposium and your, your work continues to go so well. So thank you. Thank you. Monica, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Really appreciate it, so thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Talk to us a little bit about uh, quantum simulation and, 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 and kind of what it is. Yeah, so 
I think the best way to introduce this field is to have in mind the applications that we all hope to get in terms of quantum technologies, which are very broad. They range from sensing to computing to communication. And really what we need in order to develop these technologies is understand how many interacting quantum particles work. So we need to understand their properties uh, in order to be able to engineer new technologies. And that's hard because classically we cannot really compute exactly what the properties of these systems are and that's where quantum simulation comes in. So we are trying to build quantum systems in the lab that then let us understand the properties of these systems better and then feed them back to theory and try and get a better understanding for developing new techniques. I guess that's the importance of it in a way, isn't it? Is that, uh, that uh, classic uh, applications don't really work or that don't give us that data. And so, the, so what makes it difficult is that, you know, it's a new field of, of uh, exactly. application. Exactly. So what led you into it? What led me into it, um, I think, was the fascination about quantum mechanics to begin with. Um, I was mostly interested in theory, I have to admit. But uh, what really caught my attention was a course during my studies that I took with uh, Professor Bloch, uh, which was about quantum simulation with cold atoms. And directly seeing that uh, you can actually play with these systems in the lab and see quantum mechanical phenomena and manipulate them um, was so fascinating to me that I decided that's definitely something I want to work with. Talk us through some of the, the recent experiments you've conducted. Some of the most recent ones um, are actually pretty um, fascinating and interesting, I think, because um, in condensed matter, there's a lot um, about topology and its importance for applications. Quantum Hall effect has been used for the redefinition of SI units. So there's a lot of interest in using these for applications. And um, it was a dream for a number of years now in these cold atom quantum simulators to see topological edge states in, in real space. And we have just recently managed uh, to do that. And there's actually a talk uh, by my PhD student, uh, Christoph, uh, on this topic on that conference. And I think that's very exciting. My final question is, we're on the cusp of a lot of exciting things in, uh, in physics. How do we encourage young people to, uh, to get involved? So I think the easiest way, and there's actually not so much that we have to do, is uh, foster their interest. So usually um, we always have like groups of students coming to our labs. We, we would introduce the topic to them. And um, there are many students who directly get excited. So I think the only way, thing that is missing then on our side to do is help them and uh, provide them a path, like tell them how to get along, like how to proceed and how to get a career. So I think um, that's, that's our job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you have a great week. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. So you're giving your uh, lecture, your talk this uh, afternoon. Tell us a little bit about what it's going to be on. I'm going to tell the audience about our discovery that topology plays a surprising role in Earth's atmosphere and oceans. And then I'll talk about how um, this, we're broadening the range, the scope of this discovery to other systems. It's quite an important discovery, wasn't it? Yeah, and quite surprising. We connected quantum physics from the quantum Hall effect to Earth's atmosphere and oceans. So it uh, really was kind of astonishing. And maybe opened up a whole new field of uh, inquiry. Yes. When it comes to theoretical physics, what kind of role do you think theoretical physics has when it comes to studying climate change? So I think that uh, we can make connections between different areas of physics by taking a very broad view of things. So um, uh, avoiding this kind of siloing of the subject into different areas like quantum physics, fluid mechanics, looking at connections and making those between these different parts. And also, you know, the, the debate on climate science and, and climate change is, a, is, a, is, a, is an awkward one at, at, at the moment. What role do you think physicists can have with that? Because it's so important, isn't it? Right. So I think one uh, way we can contribute is just by in contributing to a greater appreciation of the beauty of the climate system, the amazing uh, ways that it works so that um, the public We'll see it not just as a problem, which is how it's usually presented in the media, but that there's some really wonderful aspects to it um, that deserve our attention. Uh, another way is by listening. So um, 
we know that just presenting a whole bunch of facts doesn't usually move the bar. Uh, so if uh, physicists are willing to listen um, and try to uh, reach a common ground, then I think they can make some contribution. And what's next for you? So we're going to continue exploring the ramifications of this discovery, uh, pushing it to different realms, also trying to uh, apply it directly to observations of Earth's atmosphere and ocean to see uh, whether we can discern topological features directly from those observations. Now you're a fellow and a lifetime member of the uh, APS. I've got to ask you, how important has the APS been to your career? It's been very important uh, going to meetings like this. I also served on the uh, council and the board of directors, helping to set uh, policy directions. Uh, but I think that the most important thing that uh, I've done with APS is help to start the uh, topical group on the physics of climate, uh, which got off to a rather rough start, but now is really thriving. And there are some great young people that are now in the leadership of that uh, group, and it's really taken off. So that's uh, been a great pleasure for me to, to witness. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. What is physics urbana style? Good question. So we now go to the Department of Physics at the University of Illinois and see what cutting edge science in the urbana style means. At the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, our physics department is highly collaborative, highly interdisciplinary. It's also very cutting edge physics that we do here. So it's an exciting place to work. We're looking at the boundaries of what we're doing in quantum mechanics and atomic physics in quantum information sciences. The Department of Physics here at Illinois is a very vibrant university. Uh, there's lots of people in different areas of physics. And one nice thing about being in the Midwest is that I think people end up working much more together. And this is not something that you see a lot at other departments. And so this, this kind of friendly work environment makes a huge difference here. One way to describe the Department of Physics is summed up in our concept of what is known as the Urbana style of physics, which is a highly collaborative an interdisciplinary approach to doing research as well as teaching. This interdisciplinary approach, I think, really helps in solving problems that are sort of at the forefront of condensed matter research. Next, we visit a research center spreading their resources wide in hope their impact will be wider. The Department of Physics at the Gakushin University in Tokyo, Japan, consists of nine independent research groups. Let's see just how these groups work together for the greater good. When I joined the department almost 35 years ago, I was simply told to concentrate on what I was interested in. I did and made some contributions in the field of topological phases of quantum matter. Here in my group, we use state-of-the-art optical technologies to control quantum properties of light atoms. The movements of prokaryotic organisms like bacteria and archaea were directly visualized with the tools developed in my laboratory. My ambition is to discover new exotic laws of physics that emerge in condensed matter systems. I am particularly interested in a class of frustrated magnetic systems called spinize. The motion of massive objects must be quantum mechanics. We are trying to test quantum mechanics using a suspended mirror as a pendulum. We are also developing basic technologies for the future applications of quantum physics. We've been busy here at APS TV. We've traveled around the world to seek out the world's most influential physicists. And it's no surprise we ended up right back here at the APS March meeting surrounded by physicists changing the world and pushing the realm of possibilities. Let's go find out who's here. So I'm a retired professor of physics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I was there for 41 years, retired in July. Um, used to be department head there, and um, APS was uh, an amazing thing for us. It allowed us to take our students to these meetings and the invited sessions where you can learn things you don't know. Uh, it's a good experience for our students to give a talk at these events. It's just a fun talk, especially when it's in a place like this. <laughs> 
who are working on uh, hydrogen, so I uh, try to uh, develop new uh, hybrid hydrogens and characterize them, uh, see uh, mechanical properties of my hydrogen. So I come here to uh, present my work and uh, meet uh, other uh, researchers or PhD students and uh, try to, uh, to talk with them and uh, get uh, some information about uh, my professional uh, career. I'm working on erosion and more specifically on vortex erosion. So I will present my work, so I hope to exchange about this, maybe meet people who can help me having new ideas on my project and great opportunity to meet people that are doing different things from what I'm doing and to discuss with them. So. I'm currently working on some analysis on superconducting thin films and the APS is a very huge gathering for all the um, physics community. We can have collaborations and that's um, to me as a uh, graduate student that's especially um, helpful. So my work is in the field of uh, spintronics and the APS Mars meeting it is helpful for me for multiple reasons. First I'm going to present my work to all the physics community so if the people who are interested they can talk to me and I can talk to them and second, I will also uh, see the other people's works and that will help me in my work as well as I can have a very broad prospect on what's going on in the physics community. I study ultra-fast magnetism using extreme ultraviolet light. So I'm lo really looking forward to the March meeting in order to meet with uh, potential collaborators, uh, discuss our research, potentially get new ideas for ways we can approach our research and new interpretations uh, for the data that we've collected and new theories uh, to align with the experimental data that we've collected. So it should be a really great experience for networking and for uh, scientific discussions and hopefully new collaborations. Before we sign off today, we visit two universities with their sights set high, astronomically high. We head over to Princeton to learn how the physics department is conducting exciting research in cosmology, black holes and dark matter. Then we'll pay a visit to the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University and learn about their exciting, world-leading research in physics and astronomy. Let's go! The Princeton Physics Department for me is an amazing place to work. Along one corridor I have colleagues and postdocs and graduate students that are doing some of the most exciting work and research in physics. We try to understand basically how quantum phenomena, for example, takes place in nature. And one of the things that's a frontier of quantum phenomena is understanding how many particles interact with one another and produce quantum phenomena, what we call the many-body quantum physics. This is one of the frontiers of, of the field. And basically, these material systems that we study provides model systems which we can, can tackle this problem to try to understand quantum mechanics of many bodies. I study uh, a collection of neurons that make up this worm's brain. It has only 302 neurons, so it's much simpler than a human that has uh, 10 to the 11th neurons. And each of these neurons alone are fairly simple, but when they're communicating with each other in a network, they're able to perform some pretty amazing things. I hope to someday also be a professor in biophysics. I want to stay in academia, and I absolutely love doing research. So I think Princeton's a really good place to kind of help me get to that point. Working at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University is a really great experience. There are so many research opportunities here for undergraduate students, for graduate students. My colleagues and I work on a variety of topics ranging all the way from the microscopically small elementary particles and all of that to the structure of the universe. We have a very dynamic department. It's also a department that's been growing a lot and evolving a lot. We have a great community with lots of students and lots of postdocs, so it leads to a very dynamic, very active place where lots of exciting things are happening all of the time, both in terms of research, but in terms of activities, in terms of seminars, in terms of teaching. We're very close and very well connected to two national labs. One of those is Argonne National Labs, and the other one is Fermilab, which is the largest uh, uh, particle physics lab in the country. And that allows us to closely collaborate in a way that's quite unique. And that brings us to the end of day one of APS-TV and our first episode, Science Shaping Our World.
We hope you've enjoyed learning about the different universities, companies and institutions at the forefront of physics. Each day you can find the latest episode of APS TV on the TVs placed around the Convention Centre. But don't worry if you miss us there, you can tune in right in your hotel room, Channel 71 at the Ling and the Horseshoe Hotel and Channel 74 at Harris. Remember, you can also find us on the APS website as well as on YouTube and Twitter channels. Plenty of ways to watch Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you right back here tomorrow for more exciting news and highlights from the APS 2023 March meeting. We'll see you there.